In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how you can translate levels and floors from Grasshopper into Revit using some of the conveyor components that are available in the conveyor plugin for Rhino. In this particular setup, you can see that I have a Grasshopper definition that is defining a series of surfaces that are representative of floors in a tower. Uh, these graph mapper nodes are allowing me to adjust the kind of overall size and configuration of these surface floors. And so I have some level of parametric control over this definition. And the resultant output here is a series of surfaces. And these surfaces are uh, boundary surfaces that are defined using uh, this final component here. I'm also defining a series of level names. And this is using some rather conventional methods, so using the format component to format a GH level. Um, then I'm numbering every levels 1 through 33 in this case. So what I want to do is be able to take these surfaces and this information about level datums and translate it over into the Revit environment. And also using Grasshopper, update those floors um, parametrically and see those updates occur uh, in the Revit environment as well using Conveyor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Proving Ground tab to start. And the node that I'm going to end up with at the very end of my definition is a node called write conveyor file. And this file is going to essentially be a Rhino 3DM file that will have been created from this definition that contains my levels and floor objects. So you can see that we have a series of inputs here for um, the elements. Um, we can create some custom identifiers for those elements. So we can track updates from Grasshopper into Revit. Uh, we're going to specify a file path to save the Rhino 3DM file out of Grasshopper, and then we're going to have a toggle that will allow us to update that file uh, with different changes. So I'm going to start from my geometry outputs here from my Grasshopper definition and work my way towards writing that file. Um, the first type of object I'm going to create is going to be a level object. So if I go to the Proving Ground tab again and find under Conveyor, you'll see that I have a Conveyor level object that I can create. Um, so a, a level, um, as we will have uh, defined it here in Grasshopper, uh, is analogous to the Revit level. And what we need for a Revit level is the name of the level, um, as well as the planar datum, defining where that level is situated. So you can see that we already have a series of level names being defined here in this definition. Um, I'm simply going to pass that text object in for the name. And it's asking me also for a plane. Um, and a plane is going to be the uh, establishing the kind of elevation of where this level is going to be situated in space. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this um, plane in to that input. And you can see after I put that into the plane input, the, the node becomes active and is now generating a set of conveyor level objects. If I kind of zoom in to the Rhino portion of this definition, the preview, it can see that I'm generating a series of levels and I'm naming them GH underscore level 28. The name could be really anything. I'm calling it GH just so in this demo you can kind of understand that this is coming from Grasshopper. Um, but now we have the, these levels established, and what I'm going to do is prepare those to be written to this external file. Um, what I want to do is define a series of IDs along with, uh, to correspond to the different elements as well. Um, those IDs are going to be important because when we track updates, Revit needs to understand um, which object to update, and we can kind of establish that with uh, some some data on the Grasshopper end. And so to do that, I'm just going to go ahead and create a format node as such, and I'm going to pass in um, a component here to format that text. So I need to you know, bring out a panel component, and maybe what I'll do is I'll call this um, GH level ID. Um, which can be, you know, it's any kind of text. I'm just kind of defining my own unique um, prefix there. And I'm going to uh, enter in this uh, open bracket zero uh, close bracket, which will refer to some data list that I'm going to feed in to, to format my, my text. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take that and I'm going to connect that into the formatting. So that's my formatting formula, like so. 
And what I now need is maybe a list of numbers that corresponds to my list of levels here. So I'm going to go ahead and get a list length. That's at the top. And I then am going to generate a series of numbers corresponding to that length. So we're getting 0 through 32 in this case. I'm going to pass that into 0. And I will now have formatted a set of IDs. If I hover over the T output here, you can see that we have uh, GH level ID 0 through GH level ID 32, which will it's going to serve as our identifiers. Um, this, these can be really be anything, any kind of format that you want to come up with, just so long as there is some persistence uh, to how they're being uh, named when you start performing updates. Um, I am now going to define my floor surfaces. So to do that, I need to go to my Proving Ground tab under Conveyor. You'll see that we have what's called a conveyor floor. I'm going to put that on my screen as well. And I'm going to pass in this geometry into the uh, geometry input there. So this is the planar surface. And what we have here is also a level input, or a layer input, I'm sorry. Uh, the layer input is going to correspond to a particular floor type. Um, you can see that I've already populated my Rhino file here with some um, information here. So I'm just actually going to pull directly from these levels. Um, you can obviously always type these in manually as well. Um, but I'm simply going to be selecting this name, floor, um, colon, generic, dash, 12 inch, uh, which is going to be the floor type I want to assign. I'm going to hit a control C there. And then I'm going to pull out another panel component and enter that in as such. And I'm going to push that into the layer input. So now we have a floor type defined corresponding to the um, uh, surfaces and the uh, levels there. I'm going to turn off the preview of this one. So a little more clear. We don't have overlapping geometry in our screen. And what I'm going to do is, uh, sim similarly to, to how I did this with levels, I'm going to also create a set of IDs for my floors. So I'm just going to copy and paste that node sequence down. And I'm going to edit the format. So instead of GH level ID, this is GH floor ID um, as such. So now I have two uh, sets of IDs. Um, I have two object types, one being level, one being floor. And now I need to start feeding that into our conveyor write component. Um, so easy way to start doing this um, is I'm just going to simply start creating some merged data. First, I'm going to merge in my levels as D1, then my floor geometry as D2. And we don't need D3 there. And what we're going to see is if I hover over here is that we do have some data trees in play. Uh, in this case, we don't want to have data trees going into this component because it's going to cause it to write out um, the file twice and, and overwrite some information. So this component is really expecting flattened lists of information. So I'm going to go ahead and flatten that um, and insert that into the element input. And I'm going to have a similar set of merge components for my text objects, or, or my, I guess my IDs that, that refer to text um, elements that will be ultimately assigned to these elements. So I'm going to go ahead and pass in my GH level ID there. Um, and I'm going to pass in my GH floor IDs into D2. So now we have a matching corresponding list of geometry and some identifiers that will track uh, those elements. So now that I have those situated, I now need to specify a file path. So I'm going to go here and uh, go to the params tab and then find my file path component. And I'm going to right click and do a set new file location. And you can see that I have a couple of files that are already. I'm going to call this demo levels floors dot 3dm like so pass that into path. And then finally, um, I need to create a write toggle. So this can either be a button component or it can be a Boolean toggle component. Um, in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and use the Boolean toggle component, uh, which would allow me to kind of have some, some level of live interaction uh, with the kind of parametric updating. I'm going to go ahead and insert that and my component will become active. And in order for me to write the file now, I need to set this toggle to true. 
what this is now doing is it's authoring a, a Rhino file from this grasshopper definition that contains these elements. It's containing a set of levels and it's containing a set of floors. So now what I can do is I can jump over into Revit and I'm going to activate the Rhino conveyor command, which will give us access to the conveyor toolbar. And I'm going to go ahead and find and select those demo level floors here and click open. And that's going to populate an element table here that shows that we have a series of levels available to import and a series of floors available to import. Um, I'm going to go to my 3D views so we can start to see these objects populate. Zoom out a little bit because this is a tall tower and I'm going to go ahead and load them in. And so what this is doing now is it's reaching into that file, it is um, finding my levels, and then it is uh, creating those levels and it's creating the floors. And what we end up with out of this process are a series of floors that are properly associated to each level. Um, these are native Revit floors. If I double click on them, you can see I have access to those boundaries. Um, and it's uh, you know, generated from that grasshopper based data. So then the question usually is, is what happens if we perform an update in grasshopper? Will this register that particular update and allow me to update the, these floors? And the answer to that question, of course, is yes. Um, if I go back into Rhino and grasshopper, you can say that we have, since we have this all wired up and we're kind of live streaming and live writing that file, if I go all the way back to some of these parameter controls, um, I can start to adjust um, this geometry a little bit. So maybe I'm going to uh, kind of modify um, a portion of this uh, floor here. So uh, it starts to you know, have a little bit of a different geometric output like so. And I'm going to go ahead and since I had this already set to true, that file should already be updated. So if I go back into Revit and I do a refresh on this file, what it's going to say is that, okay, my levels are up to date, but as I scroll down, what we're going to see is that we have a series of floors that need to be updated. Uh, the top floor and the bottom floor have remained unchanged. Those are kind of fixed objects according to that graph mapper. But the rest of these floors have, in, a, in, in fact, been updated to a new condition. And we can even start to see a preview of that if I hit preview. What that's going to do is it's going to draw in some ghosted geometry. Uh, to show what that change actually looked like from the pre to, from the current state that's in Revit to the previous state. So a nice little feature there to preview some changes before you um, inject them into Revit. I'm going to clear that preview and then I'm going to reload my floor objects. And it's going to take the floors uh, that had been updated and essentially recreate them. So now we have an updated set of floors uh, inside of Revit. Um, so another interesting thing about this in terms of like, you know, we're dealing with a parametric workflow now between Grasshopper uh, and Revit using the conveyor tool set. Um, we can start to do some interesting things with schedules, of course. Um, sometimes you want to understand the nature of a, of a parametric change and kind of start to track these things in a more um, uh, deliberate way. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new schedule and quantities here. And I'm going to make this a floor schedule. I'm going to find floors. And what I want to do here is you know, first identify the you know, uh, type of floor. So I'm going to go ahead and pass that in over there. I'm then going to find some of this Rhino identification information. So we can see that we have a series of, of objects here. We can see when the last update occurred. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that over so we can start to see uh, changes in the timestamp for these different updates. Um, I'm also going to pull in the file path and I'm also going to pull in my custom ID. So the custom ID that we're defining here is actually that grasshopper based identifier uh, that's kind of allowing us to you know, track uh, if an object is originating from that particular grasshopper definition. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hit OK on that. And this is going to create an itemized uh, list of, of, of information that's allowing me to track uh, the different floors in my model. Um, we can see the last time they were updated. We can see the file path they came from, and we can see that custom ID. Um, so what I might do is even just pull this out as a separate window here. And I'm going to jump back into 
Rhino and Grasshopper, and I'm going to perform another update on this. Um, so uh, one to kind of just demonstrate the, the nature of this toggle, if I hit this to false, um, that's not going to write a Rhino file. So I can always you know, ensure that you know, maybe I'm making a more deliberate decision after I adjust my model to um, write the file. But so in this, that's what I'm doing in this case. I've turned that off and now I can uh, modify my geometry here. Then if I want to make sure that this is writing to the file, I need to make sure that's set back to true. Um, that is sometimes more convenient if you're updating a lot of geometry. If you have this set to always true, that there could be a bit of a delay or a lag in your update. Um, so sometimes you might want to turn that on or off. Um, but now I'm going to go back into Revit. And you can see that we have to refresh our model there. And that's going to give us some updated uh, information. These are being flagged as being changed. And you know, if I want to just go through that step again, just kind of see the, the update change there. You can see the new uh, floor boundary locations. Go ahead and clear that preview again. Um, so let's pay attention to both the geometry over here. Let's also pay attention to the time stamping that's happening in this schedule. Um, go ahead and run that. So you can see it builds up that schedule again. And we can start to see some of the differences in timestamps. So here's the, you know, one of the original model floors up here um, that didn't get uh, remade because there was no update. We can see that happened at 428. Um, meanwhile, these floors down here were created at 433, um, and it even gets gets us down into the, the millisecond. Uh, as well in terms of its timestamp. Um, but hopefully this is a good overview. Um, we, we covered how a grasshopper definition is set up uh, to translate levels and floors using the conveyor nodes. We looked at a couple of update workflows with Revit. Um, we looked at scheduling the floors themselves as well within Revit and uh, went through a series of scenarios on how you start to enable a more of a parametric workflow using the conveyor components. Um, inside of Grasshopper with the Revit environment.